morning. Uh, this is the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. It's Groundhog Day, Thursday, February 2nd. Happy Groundhog Day, everybody. Um, we are here this morning uh, to hear uh, the first pass of a variety of different uh, elections related uh, policy language um, that I've been working on with um, some of the Secretary of State's office, uh, suggestions from some other stakeholders, and um, we're here first with Legislative Council, and Tim's going to walk us through uh, the language. So thanks for being here. Very well. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Dublin for the record, Legislative Council, and I will be providing a line by line walkthrough of today's committee bill, which will uh, uh, identify as 23 0705. So, just um, starting from the top, and actually, uh, feel free to ask me to slow down, speed up, whatever uh, folks would like. So, um, we'll start with a statement of purpose of the bill as introduced. There are seven parts essentially to this bill, um, with more sections uh, than that. This bill proposes to prohibit losing uh, primary candidates from running in general elections, update the independent candidate filing deadline, uh, permit political parties to accept unlimited contributions from candidates, require the reporting of town and county committee members after the biennial reorganization of the state committee of a party, prohibit candidates from receiving cross nominations for multiple political parties, permit candidates candidates to file demographic information and to require registration for write-in candidates. We'll move on to actual sections. The first part is what is um, kind of a, a term of art, a sore loser law. Section one modifies Title 17 PSA, Section 2381, subsection C. And just for orienting purposes in the statutes, uh, this is in um, a subchapter of the nominations chapter, subchapter <laughs> nomination by party committee. The modified language adds is subsection C. In no event may a candidate who loses a major party be nominated to appear on the general election ballot pursuant to the subchapter by a committee of any party other than the party of which the candidate appeared on the primary ballot. This is phrased so that one, uh, if a candidate loses a primary, they cannot run again in the general election. And two, if a candidate wins a primary, their own party would not be precluded from nominating that candidate. Can Any you questions say that on that? Again? Yeah. But just to make sense. Sure. Not a problem. Would you like me to read the language and then my annotation, or I would like your. Um, term, termination. Your terms. <laughs> <laughs> Your interpretation. It was just that we're not in power. We're not in power. Great job. <laughs> you do. I'm happy to uh, readdress that. <laughs> so, uh, this phrasing, um, for a matter of uh, kind of syntax, uh, um, has the purpose of one, um, uh, if a candidate loses a primary, they cannot run again in the general election. And also, we phrased it in this way so that uh, if a candidate wins a primary, their party would not be precluded from nominating that candidate. So if they win, the party goes in and nominates them um, as per regular operations. So Tim, I'm gonna uh, just, because this is really about clarifying what this means on the page, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you an example. Sure. So if, you run in a major party primary, mm -hmm. so no, candidate so runs right. in the Republican primary, mm -hmm. loses. Mm -hmm. They can't file as an independent and appear on the general election ballot. Unless, so this is the, the exception, if the Republican party to fill a vacancy that arises, so let's say the winner of the primary, Bales. candidate Y, <laughs> drops out. Uh, passes away, any of the, the ways that there could be a vacancy after the primary, the party could nominate the second place person, but that's really the only way that a person who loses a major party primary could get on the ballot. Am I interpreting that? Absolutely correct. That's the way I thought. So this is pr all prior to the general election, has nothing to do with after the general election. That was my correct. misunderstanding. Thank you. 
representative chase i thought i heard uh, if a candidate wins the primary then the party could nominate them I yes that yeah so right. um candidate a wins uh republican primary then their party goes on to them on the general uh, ballot for the republican party and, and the yes yeah, sorry um i might be misunderstanding uh, I, I, I feel like if somebody won the primary, then they wouldn't need to be nominated to be on the ballot anyway. Right. Right. Um, Am I missing some nuance of statute here? Um, you know, I... Tim, this doesn't right. change anything about it. If a candidate wins a major party primary, right. they're going to the general election. They're going to Correct. Yeah. This, this doesn't yeah. change anything about that. It just means the party could nominate them also. Well, the, the party automatically uh, does that. Yeah, it, it, it automatically okay. happens that if you win the major party primary, you are that candidate's yes. candidate for that office on the general. We can, we're we're going to have um, the, the elections division director come in and talk about the mechanics of how that actually works. Um, so I might put a pin in that for when we have a director setting come. Do you know yeah, oh yeah, no, no, no. Just, yeah. no I'm just the set, people at home, you know, set. <laughs> setting expectations um, and also flagging for Will that he is going to have to answer a little, little, provide a little more color on the mechanics of that. Uh, any other clarifying questions? I want to try to, while Tim's doing the walkthrough, keep the clarifying questions and we'll talk about the context and the why uh, as we get into it. Okay. Um, moving on to section two. This modifies Title 17 BSA section 2401. And for context, this is under uh, Title 17 elections chapter 49 nominations and subchapter three for independent candidates. And this adds a new section B after creating a subsection A. The New language, would you like me to read A and then B, or just kind of go into the new language here? Happy to do either. Um, I, I think you, you can just go into the okay. new language. True language, it's fine. Uh, starting on line nine there. Uh, subsection or B, a candidate who loses a major party primary for any office may not appear on the general election ballot as an independent candidate for the same office for which the candidate lost in the primary election. This language prevents a losing candidate from running as independent in the general election, in addition to running, preventing them from running for another party as proposed above. Representative Thank you. I just have a clarifying question about a committee bill because I haven't done <coughs> any of them in my experience here. Where did all this language come from and how did it get here before we're here listening about it? Yeah, so I have, am presenting this uh, I've worked on it with a number of folks, um, and I'm presenting it as a candidate for the, the committee to take up. So, because this sounds like another bill that we have on our wall. I uh, actually um, saw that there are a couple of bills that have recently come to us where these are not unique ideas. Some of these are ideas that have been floated for decades. Um, <coughs> and we're actually going to have some of the sponsors of those bills hopefully come in. Um, either today or the next time we take some um, testimony on some of these issues next week because of that exact thing. So I think uh, I, I like the fact that actually it's reinforcing some of the things I've been working on, <laughs> that we have some of those bills introduced, but you are not wrong uh, in that observation. Representative Hoover. A foundational question. Since the parties are sort of separate entities from, I mean, they're running their own game here have their own rules to some degree. And because of that action, we're telling an individual citizen that they cannot run for subsequent election to something. I assume this passes constitutional muster. It does. Um, the, uh, there are, are other states which uh, have sore loser laws in the books. Um, they have been challenged uh, in federal courts and have been upheld. Um, about state, our state constitution is somewhat more. Sure. Um, I can certainly uh, 
provide you with legal analysis maybe at a later point. Um, um, the filling and unit. Uh, asking for your yes, opinion. Um, not. Sure. Um, it, um, I'm not sure if there has been a iteration of this in the past, which would have um, uh, presented uh, uh, opportunity for the courts to weigh in on this. It may be an issue of first impression, depending where the courts have, uh, because this hasn't come into existence yet, so that hasn't really been litigated. Um, that being said, I look to, when we uh, perform legal analysis of certain ideas that come up, we look to analogs in different states to see how um, um, the issues that um, occurred there were kind of uh, analyzed by courts and um, certain fundamental issues around uh, rights of association, um, typically with political parties, uh, that's where my mind goes, or maybe due process rights in the uh, 14th or um, their parallels in state constitutions. Um, what, how the courts kind of weigh in on those, but um, from our office's initial analysis, this passes muster. Um, if you'd like, we can look into it more. Tim, so would it be fair to say that Section 1 <clears throat> says if you lose a major party primary, you can't be nominated by another party? Section 2 is about if you lose a major party primary, you can't be running as an independent. Correct. Any other clarifying questions on sections one or two? All right, the gray keep, okay. keep moving. Thanks. We'll move on to the next part of the bill, which concerns independent candidate filing deadlines. <laughs> section three amends Title 17 VSA, Section 2402, subsection D in particular. And this also is um, in context of elections, the nominations, then independent candidates. The D1, and then we'll kind of uh, skip into uh, subdivision of it. Starting on line 14, D1, the statement of nomination and a complete and signed consent form shall be filed. Oops. In the case of any other independent candidate, not earlier than the fourth Monday in April and not later than 5 p.m. on the fourth Tuesday after the first Monday in May preceding the preliminary election prescribed by section 2351 of this chapter, and not later than 5 p.m. of the 62nd day prior to the day of the special election. <coughs> These modifications, including the seemingly perhaps odd second, uh, 62nd day prior uh, language, bring the independent content candidates in line with primary election deadlines, uh, specifically those uh, found elsewhere in 17 PSA 2356. So just to make this perfectly clear, instead of having the whole summer to think about it, an independent candidate now has to file basically at the same time as a major party candidate. Any other questions about Section 3? Representative Waters ends. Thank you. So it So the section where you say you can't run for an independent candidate for the same office for which you lost in the primary election, mm -hmm. isn't that saying the same thing as um, that line 17 where it says you have to file on that same day? Isn't that two ways of achieving the same goal? The, the filing did, uh, well, no, if somebody never ran um, and lost in a major primary, they could still run as an independent um, if they never Lost primary, that is, if I'm understanding okay. your point. I think it may so. Not be, uh, yeah. Possible. I think what I'm hearing is that uh, somebody could submit a, uh, uh, not a ballot, whatever, uh, with the signatures yeah. as either an independent or as a party candidate. And then if they <clears> lose <throat> the primary, they could say, oh, well, I'm going to throw that at one out and go the independent. So this is saying that they would have to have that in at the same time anyway. So you have to choose one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll we'll have we'll talk a little bit about <coughs> the way it works today. We did a little bit of that table setting before, but we've we've been doing a lot of things since uh, yeah. since we did our run through of the elections timeline. Um, but I think it'll come in a pretty sharp focus. Um, the idea here is that the two things work together. So if 
Okay. Any candidate who wants to appear on a ballot has to file at the same time. You have to choose at that time, am I running in a major party primary or am I filing as an independent? And then if you choose to run as a major party candidate and you lose, you can't then afterward file a, a, right. as an independent or be nominated by another major party if all three of the, these sections begin law. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, go ahead. Just to be put a fine point on what I said before, it's the independent candidate part that bothers me a little bit here from a, I mean, if you decide to take part in a party process, effectively you're obliged to follow the party process rules to some degree. So if you're coming in as an independent, we're basically saying uh, that's not, well, clearly saying that's not an option once you've gone through door A, you can't come back out and go through door B. Um, so that's what the words on the page say. I want to save debate about it for now until later because I want to make sure that folks understand what's being presented. And I will make sure there's ample time for us to discuss all of this and not on one, but probably multiple days <laughs> if we're going to move any of this language forward. So thanks everybody for uh, their patience during the first walkthrough of a, a bunch of pieces. Uh, so go ahead, Tim, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll move on now to page three <clears throat> and the next part, which concerns campaign finance limits for statewide candidates. Section four amends 17 VSA 2341 subsection A. And this, I'll skip down to the new language, uh, a political party may accept unlimited contributions from a candidate. Four, they were limited, as you can see above, to $60,000. And there's not too much to expand on this one, I think. But. So um, we're going to hear more about this. Uh, but I will just say for context that there's a bit of a lack of transparency right now. Because if you're a federal candidate, you can contribute to your political party, have coordinated campaigns, and all of those dollars are tracked. You know who those campaign contributions came from, and there are really hard limits on statewide candidates doing the exact same thing. So uh, this aligns statewide candidates, Secretary of State, Treasurer, Governor, et cetera, uh, with the federal candidates for Congress and U.S. Senator, is my understanding. Is that a fair statement in? I would have to defer to uh, director setting on that. Okay. Well, we'll hear more about that, so put a, put a pin in that. But any questions about the words on the page? Please continue. Okay. Uh, moving down to the next part, biennial, biennial committee reorganization reporting. Section 5 amends Title 17 VSA Section 2313 which is under elections, political parties, and final certificate of organization. This adds a new subsection, reordering um, what was previously F, pushing that down to G, inserting new language for uh, subsection F, which reads, starting on line 18, at the same time of filing the certificate of organization, the chair and secretary shall file with the secretary of state a single machine readable electronic document containing a list of names and addresses of the town and county committee members from those towns and counties that have organized pursuant to this chapter. So what's a machine readable electronic document? That language is uh, borrowed from some of the campaign finance reporting language, um, something that facilitates the Secretary of State's office essentially to, um, if not enter digitally, then just take a form that's scannable and um, uh, accelerate uh, the intake of information. So it has one form? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So a spreadsheet. Sure. <laughs> so uh, the idea here is that when the parties reorganize every two years, so that's the context of where this would fit in, is in the statutes that cover, govern, uh, 
a major part of your organization. Am I, am I reading that right? Yes. Um, the first in the subchapter is uh, 2301, which is the organization of major political parties, which requires a major political party uh, to organize biennially. Um, and then there are various other um, uh, requirements um, entailing that organization. And this is um, just a new element introducing the, when it is organized, reorganized um, information regarding um, essentially who's in charge at the local and county level is communicated to the Secretary of State's office. And I think it would be useful for the committee to hear well just about how the reorganization process is sort of the relationship that the Secretary of State's office has to the major parties in terms of the biannual reorganizations. Uh, for the uninitiated, every major party <coughs> re reorganizes at the town, county, and state level every two years, um, chooses its officers, uh, but it starts with caucuses at the local level, and this is about having a very succinct, easy for the Secretary of State's <coughs> office uh, way to report who all of the uh, officers and uh, members of the committees are at the local, county, and state level at, after the reorganization every two years. Any questions about Section 5? We'll have much more conversation about all of these. Just want to be. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Thanks very much, Tim. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to page uh, four, okay, yeah. um, next section or next part is cross nominations. Section six amends Title 17, BSA, Section 2472, subsection B, subdivision five, adding, sorry, that subdivision five. Um, and this is uh, under conduct of elections and balancing the contents. A candidate may not, <coughs> sorry, uh, a candidate may only list in a single part, list a single party next to the candidate's name on the general election ballot as selected by the candidate pursuant to section 2474. And I'd also like to note that later on in the bill, we um, add a subsection six, um, that's regarding bright ends. I just want to kind of I'll put a pin in that one. So if this looks familiar um, later on, that's what that is. Um, not an error. Um, any questions about um, this uh, cross nomination or what's also somewhat uh, sometimes referred to uh, fusion voting as well? Representative Hango. I guess um, right now, in terms of a candidate who didn't voluntarily solicit two nominations, one from each of the major, major parties. Um, but got enough votes in the primary, where does that leave that person? The general population voted for them on a different ballot, actually wrote in their names. It, this language would limit uh, the person to essentially picking one. And it would be up to the candidate to pick, not the number of votes that they received from each Yes, I believe it'd be okay. the property of the candidate. And um, <coughs> we ask now where this came from, this idea? Uh, th this is an idea that I have supported for a long time and that I included in, in this bill for discussion by the committee. Representative Byron. So clarifying off of the question Representative Hango just posed, so the designation on the general election ballot for said candidate would be how they filed, correct? For the primary. <coughs> like when they file their paperwork, they file the Democrat or Republican, they would move on to the general there. But if they got the necess what were previous to this would be the necessary write-ins to have the hybrid that wouldn't happen. I, mean, I think I'm asking this question really. But. Um, I apologize, I'm not quite following, uh, but as far as the um, so basics of it again. However you, you file for the primary is how your name would exist on the general election. If there was no candidate on the uh, other party and you got the write-ins, it, it would, you would not wind up having like a D 
you would be uh, listed as a Republican and a Democrat on the general. If you were to wind up winning, I think no matter if it was um, by election or uh, caucus or right in being nominated, it would still just be um, the candidate would just choose which one. Uh, and yeah. I may yeah. defer yeah. to oh, yeah. 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 I'm John yeah. yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. uh, that, that I'll say is great questions. Tim's probably not the most equipped person to answer them. I think there's another no, person in the room that can help us understand this better. Uh, and um, yeah, the next section. So awesome. let's, <laughs> I, I, I will throttle back on that. And just, <laughs> I think I think I really want the committee to deeply understand each one of these sections, but we're just doing the first walkthrough of yeah. a bill that I plan on us taking time on over the next few weeks uh, while we're doing other things. So, uh, so I want everybody to just know that we're gonna have plenty of time to learn and understand and we're gonna hear from lots of folks. Uh, Representative Reed. I assume this offense constrains uh, exists only until after the election and then if I get elected as a Democrat and be successful in getting me to caucus for the Republicans when I sit here. Um, this does not bar anything in that regard. Um, no, this uh, pertains only to elections. If you were to okay. change party allegiances or something, this doesn't speak to you. Tim, as, as I understand it, there's nothing in our law that says the major party that you have printed as being nominated as that party in the ballot requires you to caucus with that party when you are elected to the General Assembly, for instance. There's no connection or law um, about that. Not that I'm aware of. I could certainly should look into it more. I, I don't feel completely confident I know the top of my head, but there's nothing I'm aware of. Okay. Representative. Was your question if it's the law that you have to attend caucuses? <laughs> I, was, I can tell you that's not a law. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure we're right. <laughs> Not yet. Just okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to be perfectly clear, uh, there is no proposal on the table to enforce Representative Hooper's attendance at any of the uh, <laughs> D&D caucus events. <laughs> yes. I thought there was a Hooper caucus yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Uh, after yesterday, I feel like we got punchy, and uh, yeah, I like it. I wanted us to have some fun here and ask about some military affairs. Please continue. <laughs> Um, next section, section seven on line 10, amends title 17 VSA section uh, 2474. <clears throat> this is choice of parties. Um, subsection A1 uh, um, removes uh, May, and I'll just read it through, sorry. A person nominated by any means for the same office by more than one political party shall elect not later than 5 p.m. on the 10th day following the primary election, the party in which the nominee will be a candidate. The nominee shall notify in writing the Secretary of State of such choice by that deadline, and only the party that the nominee so elects shall be printed on the, <coughs> the nominee's uh, name on the ballot. Excuse me. So you can see we change may to shall on line 13. We also remove um, some uh, language breaking across lines uh, 5 and 16, I believe for um, some practical reasons that I'll defer to the Secretary of State's office to speak to later if that uh, uh, need be explored. Moving on to subdivision 2. If the nominee does not not notify the Secretary of State or the town clerk of the nominee's choice of party, the secretary shall print on the ballot next to the nominee's name, the name of the major political party for which the nominee had the nominee's <coughs> name printed on the ballot in the primary. And so kind of jumping back up <coughs> to the bottom of uh, page four there, um, there is some uh, gender neutral language introduced. Then moving down, um, we remove uh, various subsections, really kind of condensing it into um, just the first uh, being the only directive left, which is the major political party for which the nominee had the nominee's name for the ballot primary. Further, to, to just a 
quick question from here. Yes. This is just a logistical question. Mm -hmm. The stripping out, is that a word? Language um, is a previous version of this draft. It's not current law. It is current law. It that is, is current law. Uh, proposed to be removed. So, Tim, there, the two things happening here are basically that if a person is nominated by two major parties, they first can choose which party they want printed on the ballot. <coughs> we do all the other things that, are, that we talked about about this topic in the bill. So the first thing is they can choose which one of those two nominations to accept, either the one that was printed, you know, so they filed as a candidate for the Democratic Party, they won the write-ins on the Republican ballot, they have a choice. So if they won both primaries, one is a write-in, one is a filing, they have a choice. But if they don't choose, they default to the one they file on. Yes. Thank you for answering the meandering question. And, and it's when trying to turn like a simple idea into law can sometimes be, you know. <laughs> um, all right, Tim, thank you. Uh, any other clarifying questions on that section? Representative Waters? I hate to say this, but I'm very sorry. But in so when you in line 16, you remove town clerk. So should it not be removed in lines 19 and 20, where it says the secretary of state or the town clerk? of the nominee's choice of party. Page. Is that the bottom of page four, four? Correct. Yeah. Since you removed the town clerk earlier. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that may be the case. Yep. It seems like Sorry, it guys. This is your right now. I, 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 I'm, I'm seeing some nods. Yeah. I think uh, I would agree. Okay. So if we have this, this language in a future draft, yes. we'll and a bit of that. Thank you. Great, thanks. I think we should put a notice for all witnesses that we have um, a copy editor on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One it will be very helpful. Done. You're shaping up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. It's a compliment. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, Any <laughs> other questions or edits for the section? Please be okay. Moving on to the next part, candidate demographic information. Section A uh, modifies Title 17 PSA, uh, Section 2359, which pertains to notification to the Secretary of State. This is in primary elections. And I will read beginning on line seven. Within three days after the last day for filing petitions, all town and county clerks who have received petitions shall file with the Secretary of State a list containing the name, gender, age, race, or ethnicity, mailing address, and email addresses, address of all candidates, to the extent this information is provided by candidates, the office for which the candidate candidates have filed, and whether each candidate has submitted a sufficient number of valid signatures to comply with the requirements under Section 2355 of this title. The town and county clerk shall also notify the Secretary of State of any petitions found not to conform with the requirements of this chapter and return to a candidate under Section 2358 of this title, and shall notify the Secretary of State of the status of each of such petitions no later than two days after the last day of filing supplementary petitions. And uh, in sum, this require um, sorry, this is a voluntary uh, proffering of it, uh, demographic and some other uh, kind of contact information by candidates. It would then be relayed to the Secretary of State. This is for primary elections. Representative uh, For publishing or for the Secretary of State use? Secretary of State's use. Um, I would defer to the next witness as to what they, how they treat what that they data. Do it. Yeah. And we may want to dig into putting uh, that very specific language in around how this data would be aggregated. Um, but Tim, there's nothing in here that would require a candidate to report this demographic data. That's correct. Um, so this is the kind of, so uh, we'll take some testimony. I know um, Representative Blumwe has been working on this issue, and I asked if it was okay if I kind of got ahead of her and incorporated this into our first pass, but there's probably a bill, in, there may be a bill in the works 
um, on this uh, because the idea is um, a lot of times we'll get questions of like, how many women are running for office or how many people, like how diverse was the, the number of candidates this year? Um, and that data doesn't really exist and it would be much better um, for folks who are trying to get a sense of, you know, the members of this body, for instance, to have that self-reported by the members than it would be to sort of infer any guesses. So that's kind of the idea, but we're gonna hear some testimony about the origins of the collection of the demographic data, but there are a few different organizations that were interested in this, and uh, I haven't included it, but it's not my, this one isn't one that came for me. <laughs> Representative Hango. Yeah, thanks, I'll, I'll make a comment when we have those people in. Uh, the next section, I think more directly speaks uh, to your question. This has to do with the uh, modification of what's required to be put into a consented candidate form. Uh, section 9 modifies Title 17 PSA, Section 2361, Subsection B. Reading aloud, starting on line 20, Subsection uh, B1. The consent shall file forth the candidate's name as the candidate wishes to have it printed on the ballot. The candidate's gender, age, race, or ethnicity, town of residence, correct mailing address, and email address. And an affirmative statement which reads, a candidate who is not providing such uh, information may still appear on the ballot if all other requirements are met. So, Tim, is this just making it explicit that you don't have to provide the demographic data? Yes, that second sentence is. Still a Yeah. Okay. So um, section nine uh, pertains to what the candidate um, writes down and then on the form and then the previous section A um, uh, pertains to the communicating the information to the sector of state's office. That's how the two can work together. Okay. Great, I have a okay. note that I am very interested to hear what the Vermont uh, clerks have to say and I you know Carol Dawes is in our waiting room and I appreciate her being here. Uh, listening to the walkthrough. <laughs> Section 10, um, this pertains to town meetings, sorry, this is under local elections, town meetings and local elections in general. Section 10 amends title 17 BSA, section 2665, the notification to Secretary of State. Beginning on line seven it reads, the town clerk shall file with the Secretary of State a list of <coughs> Uh, a list, sorry, containing the name, gender, age, race, or ethnicity, street addresses, and email addresses to the extent the information is provided by the candidate and the end date of the term of office of each select board member, city council, or village trustee, and mayor elected. Town clerk shall not be required to ask the candidate for demographic, uh, I should say information, if it is not provided in consent form. So what does that mean about, um, like does the town clerk provide the consent form or is it a universal consent form and they just didn't provide it to the town clerk? Um, I believe the consent form is uniform um, across uh, various okay. types of elections. Um, and that uh, it, depending on the brace or the the nature of the office, um, they can be delivered to the, the clerk in some instances, or directly the secretary instance, perhaps. Um, and so this is um, <coughs> following the same kind of reasoning as the, the previous two sections of um, communicating the uh, proper information to the Secretary of State's office. But this uh, section tells me, coming from the town clerks. So this is, so section 10, similar to the, the idea of the previous two sections, we're collecting demographic data for these local offices, but the town clerks are not required to ask the candidates. It's just on the form. If they collect it on the form, they send that along with all of the other data that they're sending to the Secretary of State. Oh, that's correct. Okay. So it just, 
it, just to be clear, so it's resonating throughout that it's all strictly voluntary. All, every step of the way is what we're saying. Through random time. So the, the form has a box for ethnicity, yeah. gender, age, data. You can choose. But if you leave it blank, it's up to you. It doesn't have any impact on your name appearing on the ballot. Just means that box is blank. You choose not to. Okay. And I know this may not be the time, but just to interject that if you don't have all the data from all the candidates, it's, your data is going to be skewed if you're trying to compile data on ethnicity and whatever else it is. So. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll have um, folks come in and, and talk about this. I think the idea is that most people, if it's on there, they'll default to filling it out. And, won't have any issue with it being aggregated um, and that folks who have any concern about it will leave a blank and so that there probably will be a we would assume there would be a high return rate but we'll talk about sort of how that works and at what point is it not useful to have it if you only get you know half of the people reporting I think that's a great question that we should take into any uh, anybody else questions on words on the page for section 10 all right, let's continue. Okay. The <laughs> next part um, regards uh, write-in candidate registration. Section 11 will modify Title 17, PSA, Section 2370, and this is in particular to primary elections in write-in candidates. Uh, starting at line 18, a uh, new uh, subsection is inserted um, above the uh, previously existing language and it reads as follows. In order to have votes recorded for write-in candidates under section 2587 of this title, not later than 5 p.m. on the second Friday preceding the primary election, a write-in candidate for any state or federal office shall file with the Secretary of State a form consenting to candidacy for office as set forth in subsection 2361b of this title. The Secretary of State shall notify the town clerks of any filings made in accordance with the subsection no later than the Friday before the election. And I can pause there and continue. So this is an entirely new section. So right now, the folks are written in they, they, there's no obligation to file anything about a writing campaign in current law, right? I'm trying to get a sense for the context of what this is changing. Sure. Um, right now, and um, again, I would probably uh, defer to Director Sending it. We'll be following me for a more in-depth analysis of this. Um, okay. Right now, uh, I believe uh, writing candidates, um, they just can be written in without really any sort of uh, uh, prior to election um, notice to clerks or secretary of state as to who they will be, be other people often write them in. Um, as far as uh, the, I don't think I am in a position to speak to uh, any policy um, uh, advantages or detriments that Really be accompanying this change, but this would essentially require um, registration uh, of those. Or really, uh, for if you want to have your votes as a writing candidate counted, then you would have to make yourself known essentially. Uh, yeah, so that's an important thing to make really clear is the words in order to have votes recorded. So that means you can have somebody want, have a writing campaign, and if they had not filed, then those votes just wouldn't even count uh, the way this is drafted today. Yes, I agree with that. Interesting. Represent Chase. And uh, I, I assume you helped draft uh, H149 uh, with uh, Pat Brennan and, uh, from the Colchester delegation, right? Um, I can't speak to that, but <laughs> yes. I Brennan, think this is Brennan will be here at 1045 because <laughs> I saw that bill come through and I was like, this is perfect. We have, a, there's a, <laughs> it, it sounds very similar and that was uh, a request from our town clerk to preclude the votes for Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and other 
candidates that didn't file. <laughs> this part of the reason I'm asking questions as if I've never seen this before is because I've never really seen this before. Um, I know that um, this has been talked about a lot amongst clerks, and we're going to hear from them and from the uh, sponsor of H149 uh, this morning. So, yes, uh, this is one of those um, things that I think could make it a lot easier uh, to know who's really a writing candidate and who is just somebody who didn't like any of the candidates on the ballot and is right, you know, writing in Donald Duck or their own name, etc. And there is additional uh, new language in the subsection as well, in this section as well, um, on line four, starting on page uh, eight, um, we see the addition uh, under subsection B uh, of number one, I'll just start with B, line four. A writing candidate shall not qualify as a primary winner unless the candidate has complied with subsection A of this section and other qualifications, just to kind of round out. Okay. Uh, continuing to the next section, section 12, which modifies Title 17 VSA. Before you continue, oh, to yes. sorry to interrupt no. you. Of course. We heard um, from Representative Shy on a bill number, which I cannot remember. Yeah. H97. On line 7, the requirement to receive at least one half the number of votes as the number of signatures required. That is that is a section I, I want to just flag that we might want to take a look at. The the committee might want to look at bringing H97's language of raising that to the total number of signatures required on uh, as opposed to one half as a potential future discussion. Yeah, it's not much. Thank you. The next section 12 um, amends <coughs> Title 17 VSA, section 2472 V6. And as I noted um, uh, previously, um, uh, above in the section regarding cross nominations, we had added a subsection five to this. So this section is being uh, amended in two different places in the bill, just for clarity. Uh, subsection six reads as follows, starting on the line 17. In order to have votes counted for a writing candidate under section 2587 of this title, no later than 5 p.m. on the second Friday preceding the general election, a writing candidate for any state or federal office shall file with the Secretary of State a form consenting to candidacy for offices set forth in subsection 2361B of this title. The Secretary of State shall notify the town clerk of any filings made in accordance with the subsection no later than the Friday before the election. Questions on this? Just to clarify, so currently there is no filing or writing candidate. So this is requiring a filing, and it has to be the second Friday before the primary? This section, uh, let's see, we have proceeding, uh, second Friday proceeding the general election. Um, we have, let me double check the, uh, the previous section 11. Uh, that was section 11, and then section 12 says the same thing. For general for the elections. General election. So these are, totally new in the statute, these requirements. Yes. Okay. Um, section, don't worry. section 13 amends Title 17 BSA, Section 2587, Subsection E in particular, and in this regard, state elections, um, E1, starting line 4, reads as follows, except as provided in the subsection in case of write-in votes, the act of writing in the, the name of a candidate or uh, pasting a label containing a candidate's name upon the ballot without under other indications of the voter's intent shall constitute a vote for that candidate, even though the voter did not fill in the square or oval of the name 
new language being added under new subsection 2A. A vote for a writing candidate shall be counted as a generic write-in vote unless the writing candidate filed a consent of candidate form with the Secretary of State in accordance with the section 2370 of this title for the primary election as subsection 2472B of this title for the general election. The consent form shall set forth the name of the candidate, the name of the office for which the candidate consents to be a candidate, the candidate's town of residence, and the candidate's correct mailing address. The clerk shall record the name and vote totals of the write-in candidate who has filed in accordance with section 2370 of this total in the primary election and in accordance with subsection 2472B of this title for the general election. And before moving on, I'd just like to quickly note um, that I may have introduced um, some ambiguity into the idea of whether votes are counted or not. I would certainly defer to Director Senning uh, to talk about the mechanics of what's counted. Yeah, um, I want to know this recorded versus counted yeah. is interesting. Uh, Representative Hank, you clarify my question? I think that's what I was asking first. I, um, quickly, uh, what is a generic write-in vote? Just anybody writes in a name, whether the person has um, filed a consent form or not? Although that term is not uh, explicitly defined in statute, I believe it's a term of art used by clerks, and I'll defer to the director setting to okay. provide you a more uh, rich answer to that. So the, when we take the language in section 13, what we're talking about here is mechanically <laughs> creating this new thing of a writing <laughs> that doesn't exist currently. It would require them to um, file a, a similar uh, consent of candidacy form that, all right, maybe, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the next section in subsection B, which I have yet to get to, states um, that the Secretary of State shall prepare and furnish forms for uh, candidate consent purposes. So the Secretary of State's office would provide the form and then um, like uh, a candidate, you know, who had previously registered. Um, in order to uh, succeed as a writing candidate, you would have to follow similar procedures. And then at the top of page 10, uh, new subdivision three, here reads on line one, the election officials counting ballots and tallying results shall only list the names and votes received for, of those writing candidates who consented to can candidacy the office pursuant to section 2370 of this title. Section 14 modifies title 17 VSA section 23 or sorry 2682A and this is uh, in a subchapter of the local elections using the Australian ballot system and this is for uh, writing candidates is the name of the section. Subsection uh, A is added as well as uh, B in front of existing uh, or prior to existing uh, statutory language that uh, exists already. Starting in line 8, A reads, in order to have votes recorded for a write-in candidate under section 2587 of this title, not later than the closing of polling, the polls on the day of the election, a writing candidate for any office shall file with the presiding officer a written request to have the candidate's votes recorded. B1, line 12 reads, a writing candidate shall not qualify as winner unless the candidate has complied with subsection A of this section. Representative Cooper has a question. So in the, in the case of somebody that, you know, I get a, group together and we decide we're going to nominate and elect Mike for something. Um, Mike doesn't know about it. Mike gets a majority of the votes of the citizens. This basically says that their will shall be excluded. Their if will. Mike doesn't rush in and file a form to say, I didn't know about it, but I still don't know about it, but I'm filing a form just in case. Right, the person nominated that hypothetical would have to consent to accepting the office, I believe. Um, yes, yeah, so as so far as the will 
that's being ignored is that of the voters who wrote in. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, I would say ignored, but really their wish wouldn't be able to be fulfilled unless that candidate said, yes, I'm willing to run for that office. It would require that group to get that candidate to consent and file. So you can't no later than like the second Friday. Friday. Well, yeah, I understand <laughs> what it is. I'm yeah. um, basically saying, on one hand, you have the will of the people. On the other hand, you have the administrative. I mean, as it is now, with that situation involved, I assume the representative from down south would say, nah, I refuse, or I resign, or something. But, I mean, we'll definitely welcome a debate about whether it makes sense to allow people who are unaware that they are a candidate for office to be written in and elected, but perhaps actually put into an office that they were unaware of that they were even in contention for. Yeah, I think yeah. we should have yeah. that we should have that conversation because that is the law today. Yeah, that, no, you know, Representative yeah. Hooper's not wrong. That's the law today. Said. Yeah, um, um, met many people that I think would make a good dog catcher. So yeah, <laughs> like, what do you mean I'm a lister? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Hancock yeah. gets spelled. So how in section 14, um, small letter A, how does that differ where it says not later than the closing of, of the polls on the day of the election? How does that differ from the second Friday before? Um, I believe it's uh, the level of elections. So this pertains to local elections. Um, I can't really speak to the policy reasoning um, for opting for this. Um, however, I think it is distinguished from those other offices. Uh, yeah, that would be so 2587 is the local election? Uh, let's see here. So I mean, section 14. I, I don't see any um, indication that that's just in a local election. Sorry, and the way we format these, we leave a lot of the um, uh, Title chapter and subchapters um, out. I, so it's, uh, it's I apologize for kind of yeah. I would say listening to the statutory context in which these exist. Um, if um, if we see a, another draft, if we could get some resources to headers, sure. I, I know there's been yeah. a little bit of back and forth about that with drafting operations. <laughs> uh, so uh, that would help, I think, uh, just to clarify. But the. the Am I reading this correctly that for primaries, the August primaries and general elections, both candidates who, are, who want to have the right of votes counted have to file a consent two Fridays prior. Yes. But for a local election, they just have to file before the close of the polls. That's our understanding. And it, just to clarify, what is uh, 17 BSA 2682 A is referring to local elections using the Australian ballot system? Yes. So a, a person who's a candidate for a local office that is having a meeting where the business is being conducted mm -hmm. at an annual meeting for the floor wouldn't have to file because there are no, there's no Australian ballot. Right, they haven't opted into it. Um, I haven't thought about that uh, circumstance. I, I would say we we'll want to make sure that we haven't precluded that possibility uh, inadvertently if we okay. proceed with this. I'll just make a note of that. Okay. And any other questions for that section? Please continue. Okay. Section 15 uh, amends Title 17, BSA 2702. And this is in the chapter 57 of Title 17 for presidential elections, uh, subchapter for presidential primaries in particular. And this is, um, the section has to do with the nominating petition. New subsection F is added to read, starting in line 19, in order to have votes counted for a writing candidate under section 2587 of this title, not later than 5 p.m. on the second Friday preceding the primary election, a writing candidate for nomination by any major political party shall file with the Secretary of State a form consenting to candidacy for office as set forth in subsection 2361B of this title. The Secretary of State shall notify the town clerks of any filing made in accordance with the subsection no later than the Friday before the election. 
And again, this pertains to presidential primaries. So we did exclusively the primary elections, general, local, and previous sections. Section 15 is just about the presidential primaries. Yes. I will hold my comment because that is, it is yeah, the, I think, well, the clerks, uh, I believe, have to report every single name that's written in. So the Donald Duck, there's a very long list, especially with the presidential primaries, of, <laughs> of names. Uh, yes, especially presidential primaries. Uh, so this would hopefully solve that problem. Find it acceptable. Um, the effective date is July. First 2023. Close that. All right. Tim, thank you very much for that walkthrough. You're very welcome. Um, and what we'll do is um, bring uh, elections division director setting up next, and um, then we'll, we'll take a break and continue. And I know um, I would like to hear from Carol Dawes as well. So, um, well, do you want to come now, and then we'll we'll take a break in 20, 25 minutes. And I think they'll, we, we may not quite get through all of your testimony, but um, if that works for you, I think we should. Thank you. Pleasure. Keep our discussion going. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for being here. particular way you want me to proceed, you want me to answer questions, since I've got limited time, I want to be as useful to you as possible. Um, I think it might make sense to have um, you share, if you, if you have general specific <laughs> pieces that the Secretary of State's office is supporting, um, and then we can talk about those sections um, that you wanted to, to highlight. Does that that works. Sense. Um, also, you know, I was obviously listening and taking some notes as we went along. If I could be helpful clarifying some aspects of the bill throughout, I'll try and do that also. Yeah. Um, Will Senning, Director of Elections, for the record, from the Secretary of State's office. I guess in general, what I would say, uh, Mr. Chair, is we support everything in the bill. Um, we did not. Uh, propose or put forth actually much of what is in this bill, to be honest, but have given our uh, reaction and assent to being able to administer the changes that are included in the bill. Um, really particularly, um, we supported, and, and for the most part, although it's, it's, um, it's helpful to our processes as well, but we really strongly supported the write-in provisions. Um, on behalf of and in concert with the clerks. Um, as you noted, it's something that's been proposed multiple years, over the course of multiple years recently, um, and has never been passed. And most of the language that you see in that right section, although it's expanded, uh, had, it comes from a previous version of proposal to address that issue. And also, I took a quick look when you guys mentioned the number at H149 and mirrors that to some extent with some changes and some additions uh, to make sure all the bases are covered. So I can get to that when we get to that, but um, we, we definitely support that provision. Like I said, especially um, in reflect reflecting our support of the clerks and not having to um, deal with that issue going forward. And I'll explain that in more detail. Uh, all of the the provisions related to nominations, dual nominations, party nominations, independent candidates, um, we are agnostic on as a policy matter and it's entirely up to you all as a policy matter. I'm here to say we can implement them as they're written um, and try to make sense of them for you as well. Uh, same, I would say, goes for the collection of demographic data. Um, did not come from us as a policy proposal. 
but happy to um, facilitate the collection of that data and the presentation of it to the public as the committee's uh, legislature sees fit. With that said, can I walk through a couple of the specifics to try and help with some clarity? Please, yeah, if you could talk, if you could just name the, the section, I'll try to help direct people to the, where the language sure. is. Sure, well, I'll start, I'll start at the top, right at the beginning, um, because I want to make sure you're totally clear on what this provision is doing. Um, I think you, were, you got down to it pretty closely um, by, the, by the end of the last comments made. This only affects a candidate who loses in a major party right and says that they cannot then be nominated by another party other than the one that they appeared on the ballot for in the primary and lost so file your petition in the Democratic primary you'll lose that primary to somebody else you can't then be nominated to that same office by the party committee of another party either the Republicans or the progressives if you were to win that Democratic primary you could still be nominated by another party's committee. And, and that's where there's interplay between provisions of this bill. You would be able to list both of those, those parties on the general election ballot and choose which order they appeared in, as you can currently, unless, we, unless you implement the, the following sections that don't allow those dual nominations. So it can still be in a case where you win a primary in one party and you get nominated by another party's committee and list both of those unless you go forward with the lack of dual nominations. What it prevents, again, is just a loser in the party primary from then being nominated for that same office by another party's committee. Those comments only pertain to section one. Right. Similarly, and this is a change too. So the second section, as the chair pointed out, then essentially does the same thing in with regard to independent candidates. So again, current status, right? Regardless, and then we have the, the filing deadline move, which is just a filing deadline move. It doesn't affect any of the substance, these other provisions. Currently, you can file a petition to run as an independent candidate, and you can also appear on a major party primary ballot. If you win the major party primary ballot, you have to choose. You can't, it's current law right now, you, you guys know this, that you can't appear as a party and an independent on the general election ballot. The most common example of this, of course, is our Senator, um, Senator Sanders, who multiple election cycles in a row runs in the Democratic primary, wins that primary, also files a petition to run as an independent in the general election and he essentially declines the nomination of the general of the Democratic Party that he wins via the primary, being a candidate on that ballot, and then runs as an independent candidate instead. This provision wouldn't preclude him or anyone else from still doing that. You can still file both. You file your primary petition, file your independent candidate petition. Now, with the, with the filing deadline, you'd have to do that at the same time. Right now you can file for the primary and kind of see how that primary is going through the summer and decide whether you want to file an independent petition anytime up to three days before the primary. This says you basically got to put both of those in at the same time if you want to be covered in both of those bases. If you win again, you have to choose between the two. What this says is that if you lose the major party primary, you couldn't then take up your independent petition. So essentially, in our office, you lose that major party primary. That petition is just no longer viable, right? You filed it back when you filed the primary petition. But since you lost, this provision tells me I'm not putting you on the ballot as an independent. So if Bernie were to lose the Democratic primary in a Senate round like he does, he then couldn't follow up and run as an independent. So he, he has to, to do a candidate like that hypothetical has to win the major party nomination they filed in in order to then decline that and appear as an independent. Correct. Not the inverse. Yeah. Before we move on, Representative Waters. I'm just getting a little confused because there are so many different sections. This uh, sore loser law, does that apply only to to state and federal elections or does that also apply to local elections? State and federal. Okay. Yep. There are no, but that's because there are no party primaries for local elections. Correct. 
Okay. Just <coughs> thank you. Generally, no party affiliations in mm -hmm. local elections, with okay. the exception of just the peace. Exactly. On this particular piece, and I know this may have been eight years ago, I'm sure Director Senator can remember better than I, but you know, this has been talked about for a long time. And I, and I know that we didn't pass it uh, a number of years ago. I guess I just would like to certainly hear from maybe independent candidates or whatever in regards to this particular provision. I do uh, know it, and we absolutely. I don't want to go too far down the hole, but that it's interesting because the, the sore loser <coughs> name tag uh, in the past has been used to talk about the independent candidate filing deadline. And, I, and what you may be thinking of, Rep. Higley, is there once was a day when the independent filing deadline was actually after the primary. So you could straight up wait, not do anything, right. see if you won or lost the primary, and then file as an independent. That you still, under current law, if you guys did nothing, that's still not on the table. You have to file that independent candidate petition first. But since you can, you could, you could, it would, it, you could still activate it. Excuse me, if you lose that primary, even having had to file it earlier, this precludes that option. So the head, the head, the head. head. And two, two clarifying questions. These provisions that are in this draft language before us, they would allow somebody, as you said, to file a major party petition and an independent petition. But if they lose a major party, they, they can't run as an independent. Yes. Just the filing of my piece, under current law, A major party candidate files in May. By the end of May. When, when, how late can someone wait that's considering to file as an independent under current law? It's the Thursday before the primary. The Thursday before the primary. So we're into late July, early August. Early August. Representative. So in this case, if this were to pass, why would anybody file for a major party and an independent at the same time in May, knowing that if they lose the major party, they can't run as an independent anyway? Am I missing something? Here? It's it's the director sent more coffee this morning. Uh, Gabe was uh, Senator Sanders. So he, he prefers to be on the ballot as an independent. He caucuses with the Democrats. He wants the Democratic nomination. He has sought that for several election cycles. Um, so, but it, in, in this instance, if he wants to have being independent on the ballot, he would have to file both and win the major party nomination, then decline it and use the independent. But if he lost the major party nomination, he wouldn't be able to be on the ballot at all. So if he wants to be an independent on the ballot and also sort of get the nod of a major party, that candidate has to file both in order to do that. It is an unusual thing. I don't know of too many, too many folks who are doing that, but around the country there are some examples. You know, the senator for me and senator from Vermont. But that's really the only This is really right. like person specific. Specific. It's actually, I would say that the, the functional thing about this and um, it is more about any candidate having to, to choose which path they're, take, they're taking as opposed to filing, you know, to, to, try to, like, to try to hedge. This is about, for me, and the reason I'm supporting putting this language up for discussion, it's about the integrity, integrity of what it means to run with a major party. If you're truly running as an independent candidate, the ballot access is open to you and you should do that. And if you're running with a, with a, as a major party candidate, but this thing of being able to kind of see which way the wind is blowing and then file late as an independent candidate, that, that to me reduces the integrity of what it means to be a major party candidate. And, and that's, I, I get that, but if you truly want to run as a, an independent, then 
if you lose the nomination for a major party and can't run as an independent, yeah, I guess I see where you're going, but I don't know. I I don't like pigeonholing people into parties anyway. I, I think that this does the opposite, but we'll, we'll have time for debate. I want to get to Director Sunning's comments and clarifying questions. So I saw Representative Boyd, mm -hmm. you're good. Representative Yeah, I, I think what I'm hearing is that if you want to be an independent candidate, you just file the independent candidate form mm -hmm. and you don't have to do anything with the parties. So this is very specific then to people who want to file the independent and another major, and a major party. Right. So it is very candidate specific that we're aiming this at. Uh, no, I would, I would say that this happens pretty frequently that there's the potential for folks to try to be multiple parties and to use the cross nominations to stay on the ballot even when they, they lose. So I guess, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll bring people in and talk about that number of examples. Uh, um, <clears throat> am I right in thinking that this assumes uh, the intent of the person uh, who runs as a major party but then uh, assumes that their intent was to spoil the election potentially, not that they just changed their mind and decided to run as an intended. Would that be a question for the folks who are proposing the, the change? We, we'll, but it would have that effect. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely dive into that, but that's, I'll say that generally, yes, that's the, the intent. Independent candidate filing deadline is pretty straightforward. Moving it from the Thursday before the primary to the same um, day as the deadline for you all. But the, I mentioned it briefly when I was doing the, the overview the other day. This would, uh, in the past, I said to Rep, it would be at one point it was after the primary. The first move after that point was to this same day. So it did exist as the same deadline as you all have for your primary petitions for a certain amount of time. Was challenged in court. Tridell is the name of the case. If anybody wants to look at it, I can send it around. Um, but the court upheld the deadline at that point, as it is here and as it was then, at the same time as you all. Even though the court upheld the deadline, the legislature went ahead and moved it to the Thursday uh, before the primary. And I believe, I don't want to stress my memory too much, but it, it was mostly a discussion of um, convenience and allowing for somebody to decide to run as an independent between May and late July. Um, everybody, I think at that time in the legislature, everybody, everyone who voted for it, clearly still wanted it to be before the primary so that there wasn't that sore loser aspect of it, but they decided to give independent candidates um, three more months to make their decision. And at this point, you're saying everybody everybody chooses what they're doing, as the chair said, at the end of May at the same time. The um, next section on the campaign finance limits. I am not an expert in the federal campaign finance law. I have to pick my battles in terms of what area of the law I uh, become an expert in because I have so much to cover already. Um, but I am told that, as the chair said, that federal candidates can make unlimited contributions to our state parties. And currently, um, statewide candidates are subject to the limit of the, the crossed out big A, the $10,000 from a single source. A single source, if there's no other language in there, applies to a candidate. And so right now, uh, the party can only accept up to $10,000 from candidates statewide and, and down. I'm told that they can accept unlimited contributions from federal candidates and that the goal here is to make those the same so that our statewide candidates can also give unlimited contributions to the state party. And I would encourage you to you know, bring in the, the folks who are asking we'll, for this. I'll, we'll put a pin in this, but I will just tell you that that limitation of statewide candidate for a major party only being able to contribute $10,000 to their political party creates some very perverse things with the trying to get coordination between statewide candidates and 
it's a that hard limitation is interesting. You know, if, if you think about like just a software license to use a platform from a major party can be in excess of ten thousand dollars. And so, you know, does a statewide candidate buying the major party's you know preferred software vendors license constitute the single source? And then, I mean, it, this party this cap is create some weird stuff that we're gonna hear from. So we'll put a pin in it for now, but I just wanted to say that on its face, they're like unlimited contributions, but there's a method behind that that actually I think promotes transparency. Um, Representative Chase. Uh, I'd like to get a little more explanation maybe later on a political party shall not accept contributions from a political party. Like that seems like my favorite phrase is session, <laughs> a self-looking ice cream cone, but um, just that, that that seems a little weird but political parties do work together sometimes on elections <laughs> i think it j just really quickly i think that also applies to situations where it's um different levels of committees so the state committee can give to a uh, committee gotcha. to county to state party that's party party yeah so under state law a county committee is a party as yeah. well as the state committee is a party Thanks, Section five, and I'm gonna. I, I want to be quick again with limited time, and so we can get to the right end stuff. Um, the quick history here. So what this said, uh, the, the history is the easiest way to explain this. As the chair said, it's sort of it's the only place where our office and the law, state law, Title Seventeen, the election law, really touches political parties. As Representative Hooper pointed out, it's a general matter in the way they function and the way they operate is in accordance with their bylaws and is not regulated by our laws. The exception to that is the organization process every two years. And the state law, Title 17, lays out some parameters for that organization process. When the town caucuses have to happen, the form of the notice for those caucuses, how many people, the offices they have to elect. Same thing for the county, which happens about a month later. It, it lays out that time in that process that you guys go through. <coughs> and then, excuse me, the, the state committee is the last step. Two iterations of the law ago, our office used to receive all of the paperwork from all of the various town and committee, um, town and county committees as they organize, including copies of the notice that was posted and then membership lists, who, who, was the, who were the officers, et cetera. Our office would house all of that and get it from all of the various individual sources and then be responsible for providing it to people who ask for that information. Um, we worked with the parties a couple years ago, it was either two or four years ago, to essentially streamline that for us and it's been really, really successful for our office as, as is the way I would put it. Essentially, instead of those town and county committees sending their paperwork to us, we directed them to send it up to the state committee of their own party. Then when the state committee organized, part of I think the idea behind us getting the paperwork to begin with was for the few um, places in the law where I, I mentioned it requires that you organize in 30 towns across a certain number of counties. The implication was that we were doing that analysis and making sure that you had met those thresholds as the organization process went through. So we changed it to say file with the state party. They make the assessment of whether they've met the minimums that are required. And then we essentially turned it into a statement when they file their state certificate of organization that says we've organized in the following uh, counties and towns. We've met the threshold, we're all good. But the information about the membership on those committees was housed, is currently housed by the state parties. Um, an unintended consequence, I think, of that is, of course, that that information, all of the information about who were on these various committees at various levels for the parties um, was no longer public information. Since it's filed with the state committee, they're not obligated to share it with anybody. Um, so I believe the intent here is to, again, make that information public and accessible from our, web, from our office um, and in discussions with the parties, we decided that what would be easiest, we, don't, we didn't want to go all the way back to us accepting all of the paperwork from all the various town and county committees. So instead, it flows up to the state party. And when they file their certificate of organization with us at the end of the process, 
they just give us a single document as this says here with all of the information for their county and town committee members so that somebody can come to our office and say can you tell me who's on the orange county <coughs> democratic committee and we can provide that information well, I just wanted to give you a heads up because I think there's a couple more sections before we get to this. Um, yep. But I, I wanted to uh, do something a little unusual. And before we dive back into the write-in pieces, yep. I'll have Representative Brennan come up uh, and talk about H149 so we can kind of have both his, his comments and ideas that might be a little different than our write-in language. Sure. Whatever you'd like. Yes, it does. So the next section, section six, is where you get into the um, dual nominations. This says that a person can only have one party listed by their name on the general election ballot. It tells them that they have to let us know which party they would like by 10 days after the uh, primary, which at this point is the same time when they just have to tell us the order that they would like if they may have gotten nominated by more than one committee. Um, and as was pointed out also, it says if they don't <coughs> notify our office of which party they would like, we're going to default to the one in which they were printed on the ballot. And it does go to a, exactly the um, scenario that the chair pointed out, which would be that you appear on one major party's ballot by your petition, but then you get enough write-in votes uh, from another party to qualify for that office. You then should and do have the option to choose which of those two you want, but if you don't get around to telling our office by 10 days after the primary, that never happens. We always hear from people about what order they want their parties in, or whether they're declining a nomination or not. Um, I can't think of a time, an instance, when we had to default to what this, all of the stricken through language is, is if dual nominations are allowed, of course, then we have to think about, we have to have some direction to us in the law about what order to put those in. And that's what was written here and struck and stricken out in the case that you're not allowing dual nominations, we're not in that position and it becomes more simple to just say we are going to use the party that you were on the primary ballot for. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to recall some of the questions that were going around during your discussion of these dual nominations. Really quickly, number one, before um, Representative Waters Evans had pointed it out, I had to move also in my notes for that <laughs> reference to the town clerk. We saw that. Uh, just yesterday, and the, the deal there is that we have all of the information at this point for candidates going on the general election ballot. There's no point in them telling the town clerk. They need to tell our office at that point, so we remove town clerk from those, from that language. Again, I'm trying to remember some of the questions that came up, but as the chair pointed out, we will have plenty of time. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things with this was just the idea of what's the order of operation. So if we decided to go down this road and somebody was written in under another major party, so they had one, two nominations, what happens then? And your understanding, I think, is the same as mine that they, the candidate would get to choose which party's nomination they would have printed if we were only allowing one. But that if they didn't choose, then the party they filed under originally would be the default. Yep. If we got there, it was a little convoluted, but we, we got there. <laughs> then moving on, if we don't have questions right now on that one. Section eight, I can quickly touch on, which is the um, demographic information. I want to point out just, so the, the first section that is addressed with this demographic collection is for, um, is in the nomination chapter for the primary. So it applies to all of you from state rep up through the statewide offices. This is when you're filing your petitions with the rep district clerk 
or the Senate district clerk or our, our office for statewide candidates. And so it's just when you're filing that consent, consent form along with your petitions, it's collecting this additional demographic information. Um, it makes really clear that you do not have to provide it in order for your name to appear on the ballot, which was important to us to just be able to clearly answer that question uh, for folks. And you all know that after those that paperwork gets filed with our office. This is something we can discuss and talk about how what your preference is here. Our office then posts a list of candidates, candidate listing for the primary. And we provide on that listing all the information that you all provide on your consent forms. It's highly sought after information to be able to reach out to you all um, by citizens and interest groups alike. And so as this is currently written, I just envisioned an additional three columns on that spreadsheet uh, indicating the answers to these questions by the candidates. So you get the candidate name and the demographic information. I hadn't heard discussion about whether we do or do not want to <coughs> provide that information for individual candidates like that, whether you, it's, we only want it to be aggregated. I, that's going to take a dive into the public records law because once you provide this information to my office, it's public if somebody demands it and I need to have a legal reason why I can't provide it. Um, so that would be a project for Ledge Council to look into, I believe, if, if there's concern about that. Yeah, I think let's, we're not moving so fast that I think there, there's a need to send him on a lot of chase at this point. So I would say at this point, your understanding is if we do move forward with having this data be on the forms, then the candidates would need to understand that that data, their, their self-declared identifying demographic data would be made public. And if they didn't want to be made public, they just would need to omit that data on the, the form. That would be the default right? that right. would be public. And if there either is already or there were to be um, created an exemption in the public record law for it that would mean we can only provide it in an aggregated form I would want to and need to think further about whether the responsibility for aggregating that data is something our office wants to be responsible for on an ongoing basis but to be clear your office is comfortable with the language as it's presented here because you're just collecting it and making it available the second, section nine is, um, let me make sure, oh, that's, that's just the, the consent form itself where it's referred to. And so we wanted to make sure that this was referenced there also. And then section 10 is local elections. Um, That's right, and what I want to make clear here is that, as you can see, the current language, what's stricken through there, struck through, stricken through, stricken. struck through, excuse me. Um, the, the town clerks are currently required to provide us a listing of their select board members, and we post that on our website. If you look on the local elections part of my website, there's a spreadsheet right now with the names and addresses of all the select board members across the state. We currently are required to collect select board members and justice of the peace candidates. We have listings for both of those. That seemed like the appropriate place to collect and present this demographic information for local candidates, which the people interested in this also wanted to be able to collect. And so um, when the clerks continue to report to us, and we, we collect it after town meeting, so everybody's elected annual meetings, late March, early April, we send around a survey to the clerks to collect the information about their select board members. And again, I envision this just to be another three or four columns on that spreadsheet for the select board members. And they did add, to be clear, um, city councils, village trustees, and mayors are also included. I, I wanted to look back at our list before I came in. I didn't get a chance. I think as a matter of practice, we get those mostly from the towns that have a council instead of a select board. They send us that information even now. This makes that more clear. And then just says that we'll collect and present that same demographic data. Um, when discussing this with Carol, she wanted to be um, really clear, and I think it was a good idea that we have an affirmative statement that the clerk isn't required to ask the candidate for information and follow up. So really specifically, you know, it's clear it's not required. 
but if the clerk gets the consent form, sees that those fields are empty, they're not responsible for following up with the candidate and saying, hey, don't you want to tell me your gender um, and age and the other pieces that are asked for here. So we're comfortable with um, those two provisions also, but we should think about and address the aggregation versus not um, disclosure of the information. So for write-in candidates, it's right, this is, this is probably the, this is not probably, this is the biggest change in the administration of elections that's contained in the bill. It's something the clerks have advocated for for many years now. I'll let Carol touch on that piece. Um, under current law, I point you to, so, and the way this is structured, it's a little difficult without the, the whole body of the law to look at, right, with the way these bills are. There's three different sections here about the requirement to file the paperwork. And as the chair pointed out, it's for the primary election, then the general election, and local elections. Uh, four then, primary, general, local, and presidential primary. Um, then the 2587 that's referred to in kind of each of these where the filing is required, you'll see section 11 is in order to have them count recorded under 2587, 2587. That's a general rule in the conduct of elections chapter about how you count votes. So what I'd like to do, if yep. it's okay with you, Stop Will, there. if you have time to stick around, yep. uh, is to invite Representative Brennan to come up and talk about H-149, which I think has very significant overlap with this language. Uh, and I'd like to get his perspective and take and see if there are best of both worlds or if, if we should kind of go in one direction or the other. Um, but uh, I think just at, at this point, um, I might have you all switch, we'll take a brief break, and then we'll come back and dive in. Um, and I really appreciate Carol's patience while we uh, have this expansive conversation about, <laughs> about this. Um, and we'll have her in after the break as well. But thanks, Carol. Really, really appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, Representative Brennan, uh, please tell us a little bit about H-149. And this is available. Um, the as introduced version which just came across <clears throat> at the perfect time, represent Brennan. <laughs> Hot off the press. For the for the record, uh, Pat Brennan, um, representative from Colchester, and I was hoping to hear a little bit more of that bill. I, I thought he was going to do all my work for me, uh, <laughs> hopefully. But uh, what my bill does, it's a result, I should tell you, of a conversation with my town clerk, a hallway conversation, where I asked her, "What can I?" What can I do for you this year? Any, any wishes, any wants? Um, and this was it. So basically, um, I won't say it's simple, but it's a, uh, what it does is require a uh, write-in candidate to file a consent form to be a write-in can candidate, excuse me. So, so that um, when the, I guess when the town clerk does count write-ins, it's quite an onerous uh, procedure. Time consuming, takes two people. So her idea in, in consultation with Ledge Council was to um, have the candidate in, in the primary, in the general, and in local elections file a consent form of the Secretary of State in the case of the primary and general. No later than 5 p.m. on the second Friday preceding that election. Same for the um, any local election. <coughs> she, you would have to fire, file with the municipal clerk. So that's the crux of the whole uh, conversation. And uh, I can tell you, I'll read you um, a little excerpt from my town clerk. First, hand counting and listing each write-in name with a team of at least two election officials on election night. Second is completing official reporting within the Vermont election management system. This entails entering every name into the software re with related number of votes. The majority of these write-in names only receive one vote. And she goes on, but that is the, um, the general concept of the bill. 
She also, for Colchester anyway, in the um, August election, we had uh, 324 names just in Colchester that had to be manually with two people entered into the scissors. <laughs> separate, distinctive separate, names. Yes, separate distinctive names. Separate names. Yes, separate distinctive names. And then another 428 in the general. So uh, she said she spent more time doing those 428 than the whole rest of the election tabulations. And this, um, this bill does cover the same section of law, I believe. Yeah, 2587. Um, so, um, Representative Brennan, uh, thank you so much for coming in. I did not know this bill was coming to us. And uh, the, some folks from the various clerks <coughs> had a desire to have something like this. Uh, and so I had included a version of some of this. I think one of the key differences, is, as I'm reading it right, in the language that we were just looking at, um, the, the sections of our kind of, I don't know, I don't like to use the word omnibus, but you know, our committee elections package um, that I put on the table this morning for the first time, it does the 5 p.m. Uh, deadline Two, two Fridays previous to the election for the primaries, the generals, and the presidential primary. But for the municipal elections, it makes it just that you have to file your writing by the uh, close of the polls on election day. So it has that one right. that one difference, I think, from from your language. Yeah, and I don't I don't necessarily think the five days for the for the gen, uh, local elections was a request of hers. I think it's a drafting thing, and I I'm sure she'd be open to. To anything you know that makes it better for her. <laughs> I don't think it has to be two Fridays before uh, the local election. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. I mean, it, it is that in the bill, but I, I don't think she's married to that. That's that's what we have on ours for the three uh, the three other big elections, but the um, local elections by Australian ballot. We were thinking about letting it be closer to the uh, yeah yeah to the day. Sure, I'd be amenable to that. This is clearly an idea that is in the clerks, uh, for my clerks universe. Yes, representative. Not for Pat, but for anybody else in the room. Uh, do, do clerks start counting before 5 p.m. ever? So the uh, my understanding is the so we should talk to uh, Director Sending about this when he comes back after our break about the order of operations, um, but there's um, the, the consent form coming in 5 p.m. is different than the close of the polls that's in our local language. So I think we might want to ask Will about about those distinctions. But this is very timely, represent Brian. I appreciate you. I got lucky. Giving us the local <laughs> numbers perspective. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you so much for being sure. with us. So what I'd like to do now uh, is give the committee a 10 minute break because we've been going for a while. Uh, come back um, and hear from Carol Dawes and, um, and then wrap up with Will. And that'll get us lunch. So we'll take 10 minutes. We can go off hot. Carol, I really very much appreciate your patience. Uh, we're back for the uh, second installment here post break of Groundhog Day with the House Government <laughs> Operations and Military Affairs Committee. Um, great, and we are live. I, I want the Groundhog Day jokes to be live. This is part of this is part of it. Um, so uh, yes, this is our second half of the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee this morning, on February second. Uh, Carol Dawes of the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasury Association is here, and I think you've been with us during our discussion of the the proposed committee bill language um, around our a number of different elections items and. Love to hear your testimony and feedback on that. Oh, we're not hearing you in the room, Carol. Hold on one second. It must be on her. I think it's on your end. I'm unmuted. Are you hearing anything? There we go. We're hearing you now. I'm just going to turn you up. Um, Perfect. Okay. The City Clerk and Treasurer. Yeah. Of the legislative committee for the Clerk and Treasurer's Association. 
So um, what's your pleasure? Do you want to go back to the um, elections bill, the, the committee bill, or should we continue on H149? Um, so I would say that I wanted to get H149 on the table, but it seems to have an enormous amount of overlap, at least in its goals. Um, and so I'm going to focus on the, the committee bill language, I think, at this point, because that's what I'm more familiar with. But uh, the spirit of 149 seems to be aligned <laughs> with what we were discussing in those sections. I feel there are a, a couple differences between um, the committee bill and 149 and I will point them out as we as we get to there. Um, this is the committee bill, uh, the, the only two sections that are the, the only two areas that uh, that really touch upon clerks is the candidate demographic information uh, and the write in information. Um, and with regards to the candidate demographic information, um, as Mr. Senning said, um, the clerks already report information to the Secretary of State's office. So, um, you know, filling in a couple more columns on a spreadsheet is, is not um, a, an additional burden to us. Um, my only concern, and, and they addressed it in the most recent revision, is I didn't want there to be um, a, a responsibility on the clerk's behalf to collect or um, uh, pester candidates for the information. If the candidate chooses not to provide that information, we'll report what we've got and that's it. Um, and the, the bill is now changed to reflect that. Um, with regards to the write-in candidate registration, as has been mentioned, this is something that we, the association, have been pushing for um, for a number of years. Um, I, I was pleased that uh, Brennan shared um, the, the numbers from his Colchester clerk uh, so that my numbers are not the only ones that you're going to have. As an example for the 2022 primary here in Barry City, we had 212 different names on the, uh, the August primary elections, all of which we had to individually tally enter into the system. They represented 522 votes for those 212 different people. Um, the highest uh, vote getter was Governor Scott, who was written in 69 times on the Democratic ballot as a candidate for governor. And the vast majority of the write-ins that we see for primary are those kinds of uh, votes where um, the voter doesn't understand uh, the primary process and they feel limited in their ability to vote for the candidates they're interested in voting for. So they write them in on the opposite party um, and we have to tally all of those. Um, of the, uh, Could I just ask uh, you to clarify and then I also think Representative Hango has a clarifying question. So um, when you say that, that it seems like the voter doesn't understand the primary process, could you maybe elaborate on what your understanding of what the purpose of the primary process is? <laughs> I've noticed, I know I'm asking you a really loaded question, so if you want to, I, I want to just lay that out there and you can tell me what you'd like to <laughs> say. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, I would say, and this is my personal opinion, that the, uh, the purpose of the primary is for local uh, communities to do the work of the parties. Um, but besides that, um, it's to um, obviously uh, uh, help decide who the candidates are going to be for the state, um, statewide and federal offices. Um, where it gets challenging for the voter is they're, they're used to looking at uh, the general election ballot where they're not beholden to a particular party where they can vote their, their choice for um, their candidates, um, regardless of party. And they like the, the option of being able to move around um, to different parties. Uh, and they don't have that option on the primary because they don't understand. It, it, the primaries are complicated in that people don't understand that they're helping one party make selections for candidates. 
Um, they get all these ballots. They're told they can only vote one of them. Um, and they say, but I want, you know, one from column A and one from column B. How do I do that? And so quite frequently, people will uh, take either whatever one of the three ballots um, and they will write in all their choices, regardless of party. Um, and they don't understand that what they're doing is they're writing those people in to be the party candidate for that particular office. Um, it's something that, that clerks across the state spend a lot of time trying to do voter education on, um, but it, it, it continues to be a, a challenge for us. And it is reflected uh, very heavily in the, the write-ins that we have to tally. Hango had a question, I think. Yeah, I don't know if it's a question more than um, just to add a different perspective than the one that you're bringing. Um, you're obviously seeing it from a political party standpoint that, um, they're, that the parties are trying to get their candidates lined up. But from an average voter who I've spoken with many, um, from their perspective, they feel like, okay, um, this I have to choose one ballot and it's for one particular political party, right, in the primary. So if my um, preferred candidate doesn't happen to be on that ballot, either I leave it blank or I vote for somebody that I really don't want to vote for. So that's why they're writing it in on that particular ballot because they want their candidate that they like to be in the general election, regardless of what party they belong to. And I actually feel very strongly about that, um, that people have that choice. And by allowing write-ins, they're allowed that choice. If I may, I don't think that uh, what Representative Hango is saying is inconsistent with uh, what uh, our, our clerk here is saying, which is that there, there appears to be um, out in the public that desire to, to say, I want to support this person. But if, the, but if the purpose of the primary is to nominate the candidate for a specific party, and you are putting the individual you want to win the election on the ballot for a party's primary that they have no affiliation with, that is that is some confusion. So I think we're talking about the same thing, but approaching it from two different perspectives. And, I, and I, this exact thing is something I wanted to get out on the table with this bill. So I'm so glad to be having this conversation. Um, so can I just add one more thing? I don't think it's an, a misunderstanding on people's part. I think it's a deliberate choice that people are making. And that is why I don't want to see the multi-party affiliation go away. Well, so think, laid that on the table. OK. Uh, Interesting. Uh, Representative Hooper and the Representative Nugent, and I want to make sure we're leaving time for Carol to, to talk about things because we're going to have time to debate these things uh, but, ad nauseum, I think. <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of the stuff Representative Hango. I've talked to a lot of people at the polls who thought uh, I have a Democratic ballot, but I like Phil Scott, so I'm going to write Phil Scott in, and his name will then be associated with that vote when they count which is completely, totally wrong, but I think that's a perception in a lot of people that you can vote outside the name of the ballots and it'll actually get credited to the candidate team. Uh, that, is, that is a confusion that I think is common. That's a good flag. Representative Nugent. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, um, piggyback on what um, Representative Hango was saying, but I think, I don't think most, I think people are a lot smarter than we may give them credit for. It. And to me, it's like a, it's so helpful in this era where we have so few ways to really understand like individual choices and you know media is so national and there's you know we're losing like that um, connection you know the polling is hard to get that information that's one of the few things that we can see like how voters are actually feeling and what they really um, want and it's I think good just good data for everybody to see where people are at with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what I want to park and get back to Carol's testimony is, is the, is the primary write-in 
a true expression of what the primary is there for, which is to select the nominees, or, or are some of the ideas that are being thrown on the table today suggesting that we should, that, that you would prefer that we have fully open primaries where regardless of party. And so I think there's a tension between, between these ideas, and so I want to park them and come back to them so that we can get to talking about the, the words on the page. But I'll give Representative Rowley exactly. one last comment, and then we're going to return to Ms. Dodd's testimony. Um, just to muddy the waters even more, <laughs> California and Washington consider their primaries open, but it's called top two tier. <laughs> uh, Representative Byron just put a sticky note next to me that said jungle primary question <laughs> mark. Uh, so I just want to let everybody know at home that uh, we do not have any bill proposed, and we're not talking about jungle primaries today, but the, it gets at the thing that we're talking about. And I believe the Clerks and Treasurers Association might have a lot to say if we went to a top two. <laughs> <laughs> Those are totally open primaries, though. So. Yeah, we're talking about the whole spectrum of options. Yeah, so we're we are we are talking about the philosophical underpinnings that would lead one to support <laughs> that policy versus some of the things we're we have today or have on the page. So thank you very much, Carol, for indulging us. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I see no coat come on <laughs> Oh no, we, that is not your fault, that's mine. <laughs> I, I will say that, that uh, I have a lot of conversations with voters about what it is that they're doing um, in the primary and what they want to do. Um, and and I, I completely agree with the with the comments about you know voters wanting to be able to uh, express their choices, um, but then having them understand that that with the the primary system and the ballots the way they are now, any name that they write onto a particular ballot is going to be considered a vote for that person in that political party, um, and there is that's where the, the the misunderstandings um, tend to happen. Um, but we we would love to see some kind of a, um, a way to have the, the, the write-ins um, contained by the, um, by the consent of candidate forms or some way so that, uh, as I said, you know, you, you heard what Colchester's numbers are, you, you heard what Barry City's numbers are, um, and in addition to the, the ones where, you know, the 69 people who did write in Phil Scott on the Democratic ballot, um, there are huge numbers of them that are um, people just writing in their own names or writing in their, you know, their best friend's name or whatever, um, because they, they want to see that name reflected on a final report and be able to say, look, you know, you gotta, they got to vote. Um, and and the, it seems like it would be great to have a way to avoid that sort of the need to tally those kinds of um, those kinds of votes that feel a little frivolous. Um, the uh, the language in section um, uh, twelve no thirteen starting in fourteen, which is specific to local elections. Um, and this is one of the big differences between um, H-149 and, and the committee bill um, is that for local elections, the, um, the submission of some kind of a consent form wouldn't be needed until uh, close of polls on uh, election day. The reason behind that for local elections is we've, as we've brought this forward over the last several years, um, we heard, and it was mentioned earlier today, we heard a lot of talk about the, the sort of grassroots process that can happen um, around town meeting elections, as an example, where, you know, if there's a vacancy on the school board and uh, a group of people have talked, uh, you know, been talking with Bob Smith, who says, yeah, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring. Um, and so there's a, a, a for people who are working to get Bob Smith written in on the ballot on town meeting day. Um, and that's the reason why we, we propose the language to 
have the consent form right up until close of polls because those grassroots efforts can happen on the day or the day before a town meeting. And so um, giving an opportunity to, to have that process play out, um, but then have the clerks have the official names as it were um, by close of polls so we know what the names are that we should be tallying, that we should be on the lookout for. So that's the main reason why um, the, the difference in dates between the um, state and federal elections and the local elections. Are there other questions on writing stuff? Uh, so my, my overarching question before we go to another one in the room is, um, do, is it your position and the position of the association that you support the language as it is in the committee bill draft that we've been considering. Great, thank yeah. you. Representative Waters Evans has a question. Um, I have a couple questions. I don't know if this is the time or place or person to ask, but I'm wondering if there is a, like a historical context for um, write-ins and, and how that concept was introduced in the first place. Um, or, you know, has it been going on forever? Or, or... I don't know the, the history of writings. I, I, we have a, a ballot, uh, a framed ballot on the wall here in the office from the late 1800s, and it has a space on it for writings. Um, okay. So I'm assuming that they have been around for a long time. All right. And my other question, and I, I am not um, being flip it in any way I'm so you guys work so so hard and I get it and I've talked to my town clerk about it too about how the writings are a problem but is there a problem other than the fact that it just takes time and is annoying like do you know what I mean I, I don't want to be rude but you know my question is I, I totally understand that it takes as long as it does to count the regular votes and nobody wants to be writing down, you know, Buzz Lightyear on a write in, like on the, the candidate form or whatever. But I'm just wondering if there's any other issue of greater significance that it presents with, within the parameters of, of time and irritation. <laughs> um, first of all, thankfully, we don't have to write Buzz Lightyear down. Yeah. Okay. Or uh, people who are dead, um, people who aren't um, qualified candidates. Uh, say I had a write in for somebody who lived three towns over for city council. I wouldn't have to write them down because they can't serve as a city councilor in various cities. Okay. Um, so we don't have to, we don't have to um, break tally those. Um, the, the, and, and, and certainly there, there is a component of it as far as the, the amount of time necessary. Um, it's, it's, it's a very long day. Um, but the, the, the bigger concern is, you know, what is the value to um, cataloging all these different names and votes, particularly when it's clear that there are that many of them most of them are one of them most of them are just uh someone wanting to i mean i've had people come up to me as they're leaving the polls going hey i wrote you down for state treasurer just because they wanted to put it in there and you know it, it to me there there's little value in cataloging those um while if we establish a way to uh, to clarify who the legitimate um, write-in candidates were uh, and be able to to uh, codify those, count those votes, um, we still would, would count the write-ins as this is one of the, the differences between H149 and the, the committee bill um, is that the committee bill says they still would be counted as write-ins. They would be, uh, I think, what was the term that you used was generic write-in votes. Um, they at least would be counted as write-ins. They just wouldn't be listed individually. Um, whereas in H149, it just says we can be counted as what. Um, it does make sense that they should 
be acknowledged as blended votes, but there doesn't need to be uh, the laundry list of the different individual blendings. Representative Hanko. Were you dying? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted a definition of that term generic write-ins because the attorney wasn't sure of the actual definition um, and town clerks kind of use that term. So it's just, um, they're not listed by name, they're just counted. And we had 10 write-ins today. That's a generic write-in. Yeah, it would, uh, you know, for example, at town meeting, if, if I had Three people turn in consent forms saying I have, am running as a write-in campaign, a running a write-in candidate for school board and for city council. And we then, during tallying of the ballots, we had, you know, 50 write-ins, and 30 of them were for the named candidates. We would put the ballots, put the counts for those named candidates under write-ins, and then we would have sort of an other all other write-in kind of uh, whether whether we uh, use the term generic or other or unnamed or some other some term that that uh, identifies that they are also write-ins but not uh, but they haven't been um, sort of authorized by the consent of candidate forms. So what what another way to say that is that if we passed this language, that there would be potential for candidates who had done the consent, they would be counted and their their vote totals of their write-ins with their name would be in the report, but that all other write-ins would just be kind of lumped in as write-ins, generic, generic write-ins, as just the total number of write-ins, regardless of names. So you, for instance, gave the example of a few hundred votes of, of that represented a couple hundred candidate names, so that, that the sort of average was one or two votes per candidate named, and that all of those would just be lumped in as one line instead of listing out the 200 names. All right. Which does seem to make more sense. It, the, um, the the H one forty nine says that that if they're not if they haven't gone through the sort of um, consent process to be an, a named write in candidate, um, those those write in votes would just be considered blank. It does make sense to acknowledge that that people did take the time to write in rather than just leave it blank, and that would that would be part of our, our tallying at the end of the day. Representative Nugent has a question. Um, I don't, I, I'm wondering, I guess, if this is common, because I, just being like a data nerd, maybe, um, and how we have a lot of, um, in some of the higher, the state level elections, there were quite a few people in the primary Democratic, um, and so I was curious to see, like, the vote tallies, and <clears throat> when I looked at that, there were a lot of write-ins for like um, the people who didn't win the primary, but and you know wouldn't have I don't think put themselves on the ballot. But I just I think that's kind of interesting and helpful to see um, where people are at, and and I thought yeah I thought I saw like uh, many write-ins for the same candidates for some of those like. Um, statewide elections, like attorney general, secretary of state, governor, these kind of things. <clears throat> Any other questions for Clerk Dawes? Carol, uh, feel free to stick around. I think we're going to invite Will back up for uh, the end of um, the elections division uh, comments and walk through on the sections that he wasn't able to cover. Um, everybody's been very patient with me trying to roll, roll out uh, all, all of this. So if you want to hang in the room, please feel welcome to, to listen in. And <coughs> you may, you may uh, be able to chime in with uh, some supportive comments <laughs> uh, during you know, Will's uh, bag cleanup here. Will and I did uh, um, speak late yesterday afternoon and, and uh, and the, the draft of the bill as it currently exists um, 
certainly reflects the comments that he and I, or the conversation he and I had yesterday. So, um, as I said, we're uh, the association um, supports the the draft as currently exists. I am going to in the background and listen, but I have to start proofing my town meeting ballots. So, <laughs> uh, I appreciate you being here during this busy time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Welcome back, Will. Thank you so much for thank you being patient with us. And I, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think it's, maybe we'll pick up there on the right-hand section while it's fresh in folks' heads. And I can respond to a few items. Um, as Carol mentioned, we we'll go right to that. The the H one forty nine and is based on, at my first glance at it, similarly legislation that was introduced a couple of years ago, two or four years ago, and also included that um, language where <coughs> right in votes, excuse me, for people who had not filed the form would be counted as blank. I can't remember if that language came from our office or not, but I have rethought that since then and feel like it is a better approach to um, report them as write-ins. We use the word generic in here. That can be changed if people don't like that. And it was sort of, that was my last, last minute move with Tim. Um, the point is what you were discussing though, is that you would still have a, a row on the results spreadsheet that is write-ins that weren't, that, did, that hadn't registered. And I think it's it's valuable information for people to know, you know, the the general quantity of votes that are being written in versus left blank. I think there is a distinction there, right, in what the voter's communicating. Um, to put a fine point on that, I hope everyone appreciates <coughs> that we keep really close track in elections and results of elections. So for instance, what I'm talking about is we know how many ballots were cast in each town or in each district. And what we look for on the official returns of votes that the clerks file is that the bottom lines reflect that number. That means that you have a full accounting of the votes cast in each of those race, races of each ballot. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that's the practice everywhere and it's interesting, it's um, a distinction in, in how the votes are counted here at the legislature for some of the statewide offices, to be frank. Um, if you do it the way we do it, which is make sure you account for every single ballot, you have the categories you have are candidate names, write-ins, <coughs> blanks, overvotes, and that leads to a total. Could you define overvote for the uninitiated? Overvotes are somebody who marks more ovals than candidates to be elected in a certain race. Most of our races are vote for one, the, the statewide offices. So say you vote for two gubernatorial candidates. The people counting your vote can't make a judgment about which of those was the intended vote. They can't pick out of the two you marked. So what do they do with that? They say it's an overvote. And in a vote for one race, you record one overvote there because you would expect one vote to be cast for that, for that race on that ballot. In, for instance, a vote for two race in one of your districts, if somebody then goes ahead and votes for three candidates, same, you can't choose which two out of the three they meant, that's reported on the official return of votes as, as two in the overvote column, actually, because you would expect to have two candidate votes above. And that's how, if you look at their official returns of vote, and we tear our hair out, in the week after the election when we're talking about results processing just making sure that the bottom lines in each of those races add up to the same thing most of the time it's actually not it's it's that accounting for overvotes that throws those off so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about here which it's just which of those categories we want to put certain votes in I think why, it, why, it's referred, why the, the term blank came through, because in the same bill, some provisions that did pass in that bill in the past is what Carol's referring to, where we finally said that the fictitious names and the names of dead persons 
should be counted as blanks. That's current law and is in there. So if they come across the Abe Lincoln or Mickey Mouse or the other guy, Buzz, um, those go in as blanks. But it, it leads to that same accounting, that ballot that vote counts is counted for. So that's what we're talking about here is if somebody didn't file, how are we going to report that vote and have the bottom line totals still continue to line up for each of the races? And I think instead of calling them blanks, it makes sense to have a, a, a line for write-ins that haven't filed. And so just as Carol described, you're going to have your named candidates on the ballot. You're going to have any registered write-in candidate names and their totals. Write-ins, be it if we call them other write-ins, generic write-ins, unfiled write-ins, and then blanks and open votes. Um, that way, if people looking at the results have a general idea of how many write-ins were cast in a given race that weren't just blank votes, people skipping over it. More importantly, what I want to I want to make sure the committee understands and call your attention to that there are two places. We talked about the four elections that are being addressed here: presidential primary, statewide primary, general election, local elections. In two of those, the primary election and local elections, there is a um, minimum threshold requirement for write-ins. Primary, you have to, you, to get written in, I believe you have to have one half of the number that are on the petition. And in locals, it's 30 or 1% of the checklist, whichever is less. The most important thing I think that the committee should consider, and I'd be really curious Carol's opinion on this too as I talk it through, is whether someone who failed to register as a write-in candidate with these de new deadlines two Fridays before the election should still be able to be come be declared the winner if they were to receive enough votes across those minimum thresholds. The way the language is currently written in both cases is no. And that that is certainly the easier way to administer it for the clerks. Because then again, they, you know, they get their list of names, and those are the only names that they're even paying attention to how many votes are cast for that person. If you kind of went with, if you wanted to go with a more with a middle ground, where you said in general we're just going to report the names of candidates who have filed beforehand, the vast majority, and right in the general in the general election context and the presidential primary context. You're really just talking about saving the clerks a massive headache of reporting names. The, the, the ballots are full of names. The minimum thresholds don't matter because they, even if they cross those thresholds, they're getting so many fewer votes than any of the named candidates. Those thresholds are, exist in the primary and in local elections because it's so more, much more likely that there's going to be an open nobody file for a certain office. We talked about the, the Republican and progressive primaries where there's many, many offices that are empty and don't have candidates filed. That's where those thresholds become important. But when I think this through in my head, if you, that middle ground uh, reduces a lot of the positive impact of this for the clerks. Because it means that their counters still have to be paying attention and counting really carefully, adding up the vote totals of the various names that they see in those instances to see whether or not they would cross the threshold. You know, I could, I could see a version of this bill that says, you don't have to report any names in any of these instances like we have it unless a person were to cross the threshold. And I've thought through in a race for an office that had no named candidates, that could kind of target the attention of the clerk. So in this empty race, of the ballot, you want to make sure you're counting and seeing if anybody hits the threshold. Um, a cleaner way, and, I, and I, I think it still makes sense to me, and I still support it as it's written, is just to say, if you even want to qualify over those thresholds, you got to think ahead and file the paperwork two Fridays before the election. And the clerks really don't even have to keep track of adding up the totals that might be written in for one name might be written in two or three times. Unless they're registered, they're just putting that in the writing column, putting that in the writing column. Um, I just thought that was important to point out. I didn't want to gloss over it as we're having the discussion. And the, 
the close of the polls deadline for local elections gets at, at that issue to an extent. To an extent. Yeah. Still, if somebody missed by the close of the polls, there's an empty <coughs> office on your local ballot, which is pretty common, and somebody didn't reach the threshold, somebody reached the threshold, excuse me, but hadn't filed by the close of the polls, as it's written right now, they wouldn't, they wouldn't take that office. Um, so what if there was an empty uh, position with nobody on the ballot and only you know, five people bothered to write in somebody and they all wrote in the same person, would that position just not be filled? Or? Yes. But pretty common to, to come out of local elections with certain positions. Yeah, fill. I think th this is a question that, given uh, that we're bumping up against time, this, this is definitely one that we need to think just through. Think I wonder um, if Carol has any uh, initial reaction if she do this here, but um, we could take that an another time since you had asked Will. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, are you asking me for some feedback? <laughs> yeah, Carol. Um, so Will had brought up the, the idea of I heard, I heard what he was talking about. Yeah, a, thre a threshold for writing candidates, even if they didn't <coughs> file. Um, and if that would sort of negate the virtue of, of the system that is envisioned in this draft language. Um, I, can, I can sort of see a middle ground of a middle ground. <laughs> um, if it's a, depending on whether it's the, the kind of, as an example, I have I have a, a two-person legislative district in Barry City. So I would know whether I had anybody who had the requisite 25 signatures if it if it sticks with half of the um, the petition amount. I would know for for a local election if I might have that number. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. for uh, one of the one of the um, offices that's up for election where you um, aggregate numbers across legislative districts or or counties or or statewide. Um, obviously, it, it becomes a, a bigger a bigger issue. So I think that I think there's there it's worth having some additional think time around it. It's a very good point, Carol. Thank you. And I don't want to. I don't want to brainstorm in, in front of the committee, but that might be addressed by right if it were limited to scenarios where there were no candidate on the ballot, and then we could have all the clerks that are that are counting votes for that given office that's empty be aware of the need to. At that point, though, you're right. You're back to basically reporting the totals for everybody on that race. But only in that race. Only Where in that race. On the ballot. Yeah. I think that's worth, so I just want to, for, for uh, Tim, our legislative council is in the room and for everybody, I think the, the next iteration of us talking about this, I'd like us all to think through if there's no candidate on the ballot, a threshold where it would make sense. Because that seems to me to be a middle ground unless there's something I'm, I'm missing. Um, but I'd say, I'd say, keep in mind, right, the, the filing deadline for the primary is where this is going to be an issue, is in late May, and you have two and a half months to file this write-in candidacy to, right. for, for the parties themselves to identify an empty office, figure out somebody who they want to be their write-in candidate for that office and file. The, the much cleaner approach is what's here and the much more easy for the clerks to follow and not to have to be thinking about these various exceptions to the rule. Um, just, just keep in mind the amount of time that people have to figure it out and get this right in paperwork filed. Yeah, I'm, I'm very supportive of the idea that we probably want to be electing people who know that they're a candidate for office and have thought it through at least a week and a half before uh, the election. 
question. That's me. Uh, we should really talk about that. <laughs> um, so we have had quite a morning. Uh, is there anything else, Will, that you'd like to tell us uh, about the, the first pass on this draft language in the next few minutes? Now I am brainstorming in front of you, but <laughs> another option could be, just to put in, in folks' heads, picking elections here. It, this is a serious problem in the presidential primary that raises none of these other issues, and we could just say you not don't have to report those names to anybody who doesn't register for the presidential primary. There's always a full slate of candidates. There's no minimum threshold. Same thing for the general election. We could think about whether there's a special rule or an exception in the primary would be one other way to approach it. So just to, for folks who, who may not have been involved in a, in a lot of the primary elections, if we get into a situation with a primary election and, we, and there's, no, there's no name on the ballot for a party, What's the current procedure generally that happens uh, when there's when there is no candidate for one of the major parties? People write in whoever they choose to write in, if anyone, and there's a minimum threshold to win, and then above that, it's you know who gets more. So let's just say hypothetically, um, it's a house race, the minimum threshold is 25 signatures, uh, 25 votes because it's a 50 signature threshold. And 20 people write in John Doe. So uh, he doesn't quite make the threshold. <laughs> What's the mechanism if the party wanted to make John Doe the nominee for that party on the general election? They can just hold a caucus and do that, right? Pretty quickly right after the primary, but yes. That's one of the reasons by which a party committee can nominate is failure to elect, failure to nominate by the primary. So the primary election itself is the only opportunity. Representative Morgan. Yeah, I believe on that. I think the process, if I understand correctly, they have to have a duly warned, properly warned meeting to conduct that business, correct? Correct. Okay. And it's um, depending on the office <laughs> is which committee conducts that. <coughs> Thank you. State committee, state offices, county, county yeah. offices. Well, thank you very much, Carol, Will, Tim. Uh, this has been a highly educational morning. We got a lot out onto the table. It's kind of relief for that. Um, I uh, know that we have, uh, we're switching gears um, this afternoon and tomorrow on other topics, but we'll be coming back, uh, I think, Tuesday afternoon um, to take a, a look and hearing from some other voices on a couple of these issues specifically. Um, it's my intention at this point. We'll be getting an agenda out for next week uh, by tomorrow. And it's always one of the, the most challenging things to figure out here. But um, yeah, I will uh, be seeing everybody um, back here this afternoon. I think we're on at um, 1 o'clock. It will be um, talking uh, about the sports wagering um, and with some experts on problem gambling. So. Totally different topic this afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll be going offline.